Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webcast. My name is Ben Frost, and I'm with APA's Northern New England chapter, and I'm one of the coordinators of the planning webcast series. This series is brought to you by a consortium of over 40 of APA's chapters and divisions. The consortium itself is not affiliated with APA, but rather is a loose-knit association whose mission is to provide high-quality free webinars on topics important to planners that will also help them to meet their certification maintenance requirements. Today is Friday, November 30th, 2018, and we'll hear the presentation in retrospect, Hurricane Harvey and the impact on African-American neighborhoods. For technical help during today's webcast, type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen, or call the 1-800 number shown here. For content related questions related to the presentation, please type those questions in the question box also located on the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen. We'll answer those questions as time allows at the end of the presentation during Q&A. And here's a, a list of the sponsoring chapters and divisions. I want to thank all of them uh, for making these webcasts possible at no additional expense to their members. Today's webcast is brought to you by the Planning in the Black Community Division of APA. You can learn more about the division and how to become a member of it at this link, also available on the APA website. And here are a few of our upcoming webcasts. You can see that we're now scheduling into 2019. Um, we have some open dates available. Most of the dates in 2019 are open. Uh, you can register these webcasts by visiting our website, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. Uh, and if you have a topic that you'd like to uh, put out for your fellow planners, uh, please get in touch with us and we'll be happy to get that scheduled. To log your CM credits, go to your uh, APA account at planning.org. Under the CM log, you can search for CM activities and in the, in the search bar, type the event number or title of today's webcast. And both of those can be found at the planning webcast webpage, but note that credits for today are pending, so they're not uh, quite ready yet. You can like us on Facebook and learn about upcoming webcasts. We are recording today's webcast and the video of it will be available on our YouTube channel here. You can search for planning webcast series on YouTube or you can use this link. We'll also have PDFs of presentations at our website at ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And now I want to introduce uh, one of today's speakers, Joy Simeon. Uh, Joy is a, Joy is a doctoral student at the University of Texas A&M, uh, or Texas A&M University, excuse me, people are sensitive about those things, studying urban and regional studies sciences with a focus on hazard mitigation. Joy's research interests are in building community capacity within multi-hazard communities using digital technologies. She's also interested in understanding the relationship that social capital plays in communities of low income and of and of color post pre-post disaster impact. So Joy, I'm gonna hand the screen over to you and take it away. Good afternoon. Um, like you said, my name is Joy Simeon, and I'm a doctoral student at Texas A&M. Um, I have the honor of being awarded the Robert A. Catlin David W. Long Fellowship this past summer. And as part of the fellowship, I was asked to examine the immediate effects that Hurricane Harvey had on the African-American community within Houston. A few of the areas that, sorry. A few of the areas that I will cover throughout the presentation will be a brief summary of the lit review, the overall research design, and some of the major findings. Of Since 1980, disasters have increased in frequency and in duration. In fact, there has been over 230 weather and climate related incidents, costing over $1.5 trillion. The 2017 hurricane season was one of the most intense and active seasons the U.S. has experienced. There are over 17 named storms, 10 hurricanes. Six of those hurricanes were measured at a category range between three and five. The three storms were the greatest U.S. impacts with Hurricane Irma, Maria, and of course, Hurricane Harvey. These storms cost the United States over $300 billion in damages. 
Natural disasters have long been a concern for communities, especially those of low income and of color. These concerns are not just linked to the physical damages of a storm, because it's very clear that storms have no respect of person. The disproportionate impacts within these communities, pre and post disaster impacts, are often linked to social vulnerabilities within a community, like those of low income, immobility, disablement, and elderly populations. They are linked to the strengths of social networks. For example, who will an individual call or reloc relocate if damages occur, if evacuations are needed? This study examined Hurricane Harvey and the impact that Hurricane had on the Gulf Coast, specifically in Houston, Texas. Hurricane Harvey initially made landfall in Rockport, Texas, and was measured at a Category 4. It caused flooding at scales of 1,000-year storm, and the storm initially made landfall on August 24, 2017, and it primarily caused devastation in Louisiana and in Texas. Um, other areas it impacted were Arkansas and in Tennessee. Uh, they also received some damages from the storm as the storm cut up towards the eastern part of the United States. The storm released over 27 trillion gallons of water and it destroyed over 40,000 homes and caused over $150 billion in damages. These dollar amounts account for damages to homes, furnishings, vehicles, commercial real estate, and even public infrastructure. I chose Houston, Texas as the area of study for this project because of its proximity to the coastline and the devastation it received as a result of Hurricane Harvey. Houston is located a little over 30 miles from the Gulf Coast and is home to the Port of Houston and the Ship Channel, which makes it susceptible to not only hurricanes, but also storm surges. The city has a population of over 2 million people and is comprised of six wards containing 88 super neighborhoods. And a super neighborhood is a planning designation by the city of Houston to set priorities and address concerns of the community. Houston experienced approximately 51.88 inches of rain, which is equivalent to 1.2 trillion gallons of water. It overfilled bayous, levees, dams, and reservoirs, which had to go under, which underwent control releases to prevent possible breaching. The storm caused flooding both in historical prone areas, but also in the areas that had never seen flooding of this nature. As a result, the storm caused over 68 direct deaths, like those related to direct impacts of the storm, and 35 indirect deaths, those as a byproduct like heart attacks because of their impacts of the storm. As stated, disasters are increasing, but one of the questions that is important to examine is that as these disasters are increasing, who is being impacted and are they adequately responding and recovering from disasters? Through this research project, I asked the question, were African-American communities underrepresented throughout the disaster cycle as compared to other ethnic groups? It is also important to note that this was not a rigorous study, but an exploratory endeavor to examine overall experiences of the African-American population and how the events surrounding the storms were reported. So I examined this question using a mixed method approach broken into three different phases. The first phase was mapping using GIS. Um, the second phase was a content analysis. And the third was expert telephone interviews with community leaders. In phase one, my unit of analysis was community tabulation areas. These CTAs were developed by the Kinder Institute designed to serve as an approximation of super neighborhoods based on census geographic boundaries. I collected spatial data from Kinder Institute and the City of Houston open data website. Then I used the data to determine numbers of homes affected by the storm and to determine the number of African Americans affected. This first map uses census level population data to illustrate the locations that contain the highest percentage of African Americans living within the Houston CTAs. The darker the color, the higher the percent of African Americans living in that particular CTA. The top 15 African American neighborhoods are located within the Southeast and the Northeast Houston region. The second map uses the spatial data collected from Rice and the city of Houston to illustrate the CTAs that were greatly impacted by Hurricane Harvey. The darker the color, the higher the percent impact. The unit of analysis here is housing units. I then overlaid the African-American population map over this data set to determine if higher areas of African-American populations experienced more flooding as compared to other areas and found that there were only moderate level of flooding as compared to other areas, even in the top 15 heavily populated African-American CTAs. 
The table on this slide highlights the top 15 African-American neighborhoods and their percent of units impacted by Hurricane Harvey. The top three CTAs were Manitex, Acre Homes, and Third Ward. To further understand the results of the visual, a t-test was conducted to compare the means of the percent of the housing units within CTAs and the percent of neighborhoods containing high numbers of African-Americans. The results of the t-test show that there is no major statistical difference. The key takeaway from this section or this phase is that there was no major correlation, there was no statistical significance, and nor was there any way to just look at the map and definitively say that there was a difference between areas with high levels of African-American residents and areas comprised of other ethnicities. However, this does not mean that people living in these regions were not disproportionately impacted. It just means that the spreading was so widespread, just doing the GIS is not sufficient. Phase two, we use the content analysis to determine if the media highlighted African-American neighborhoods impacted by Hurricane Harvey. The unit of analysis here were pre-identified phases, phrases and words about race and disasters. We use four media outlets, two national media outlets, was the New York Times and Cable News Network, and then two local media sources, which was Texas Tribune and the Houston Chronicle. These outlets were chosen based off content analysis literature. Myself and a second coder counted all the words and phrases pertaining to Hurricane Harvey and recorded them using a Google form for 144 articles. The results of the content analysis indicated that neighborhoods were mentioned 144 times. Of that amount, African-American neighborhoods were mentioned 46% of the time compared to other neighborhoods. Those of the varying ethnicities were mentioned 54% of the time. 14 African-American neighborhoods were increasingly mentioned, but only three neighborhoods mentioned correlated with the mapping analysis, which was East Houston, Acres Homes, and Cashmere Garden. We also looked at whether the article contained pictures of majority black residents, which only occurred 15.3% of the time. And many of those same pictures were repeated in other articles that did not pertain to the topic being discussed. We also looked at whether or not the picture had flooded streets, which was about 73% of the time. The key takeaways of the content analysis was that African-American neighborhoods were mentioned less than neighborhoods comprised of other ethnicities and the African-American images were used in multiple articles on variant topics related to Harvey, some of which did not even relate to the topics presented in the articles. These takeaways are significant because when it comes to ensuring that all people are represented equally and equitably, it is hard to do so when they are not given a platform to stand on. In phase three, I used a combination of a self-selection, snowball, and convenience sampling method to conduct telephone interview with community leaders in regard to the community disaster preparedness, response, and recovery processes. These community leaders representing 10 neighborhoods, although not comprehensive, the respondents and the information collected provided a method to explore these processes. Our initial sample size was 24 community leaders, but I only received a response from 15 of those community leaders. The survey instrument contained 12 questions lasting about 15 minutes. The preparedness results indicated that before Hurricane Harvey made landfall, 60% of participants said there were no trainings or supplies available to their neighborhood. The other 33% said the trainings and the supplies were available, while 7% of the respondents chose not to answer or did not know the answer to the question. The response results indicated that after Hurricane Harvey made landfall, 64% of the community leaders, about nine of the community leaders, stated that their neighborhoods had to be evacuated by the National Guard, fire trucks, et cetera. The length of the response took between a few hours and a few days. When asked if there were any Good Samaritan rescues, everyone who answered the question said yes. The response time for Good Samaritan rescues were within a few hours. The recovery results indicated that 50 to 100% of the homes within the neighborhood received some type of damage while 58% of those homes still need repairs. The types of repairs that are still needed are both structural and non-structural. Most of the damages that occurred were quite severe. This question was asked as an open-ended question and the respondents reported that there is still need of mold remediation, foundation work, framing, and they're also requesting resources to elevate homes to prevent repeat flooding. 
because most of these areas are near the bayous, the swamps, and other tributaries leading throughout the Houston area. The recovery results also indicated that 55% of homes that were damaged were occupied by the elderly. 56% of homes were occupied by children, and of those homes, 53% still needed repairs. When asked if Hurricane Harvey affected any major infrastructure within the community, all the respondents said yes and noted that Hurricane Harvey just exasperated areas that were already concerned in the community. This was also asked as an open-ended question, and some of those issues were buckling roads, sidewalks, poor drainage, and all have been attributed to the need for bayou remediation. When respondents were asked, did Hurricane Harvey affect the community's ability to access fresh fruits and vegetables? 86% of respondents stated that the food accessibility was an issue before and after Hurricane Harvey made landfall. 89% of businesses returned to the neighborhood. However, some of those businesses took upwards to six months. One respondent indicated that places like the Foodorama, a grocery store, were quicker to return than the mom and pop like shops. Key takeaways is that Hurricane Harvey exasperated the already present issues within the African-American communities within Houston. Like most studies, this study contained a wide range of limitations, such as a short time period to complete the study, the inclusion of the secondary data sources, and interviews were not random sampled and contained a very small sample size. However, this study was adjusted to handle those limitations with the use of a second coder for the content analysis and the support of hazard specialists. We also elected to interview community leaders as compared to individuals as a reliable source of information for the con entire community. As stated, this was not a rigorous study, but an exploratory endeavor to examine overall experiences of the African-American population and how the events surrounding this storm were reported. The idea of this study is that we understand in a preliminary fashion that communities are being distortionally misrepresented, and hopefully these gaps can help to reshape practice and planning by sparking a conversation. Rather than concluding this presentation with quick facts, I wanted to include a call to action. As a researchers, we know that disasters are increasing. We also know that disasters in and within themselves have no respect for a person. But so many times as researchers, we interview and survey and we map outcomes, yet we rarely come up with beneficial solutions. So as you go out and continue doing amazing studies, let's think about methods to increase community capacity, develop mitigation practices, housing and infrastructure remodeling, et cetera, so we can help the communities in which we work be resilient. I also want to acknowledge all those who made this research project successful and thank you guys for listening. Um, a special thank you to Texas A&M University faculty, Texas Southern University, and my research team and the community partners. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. I, I now want to turn it over to and introduce Derek Hall from the Planning in the Black Community Division of APA, who will uh, have some information and will also introduce our other speakers. Great. Thank you, Ben. And a good afternoon, or if you're in California on the West Coast like me, good morning. I certainly want to thank each and every one of you for participating uh, in this webinar. This is Planning a Black Community Division's first webinar for the 2019 uh, calendar year. And so we are excited uh, to provide this for you. And this is also historic because today is November 30th, and today is technically the end of hurricane season. Um, there were certainly uh, some impacts that uh, this country and other countries, particularly in the Caribbean, experienced. Um, and so we thought it would be helpful to just bring information to those who are interested uh, in hazard mitigation planning uh, in terms of issues of climate change uh, and what we can do. Um, and uh, we could not be prouder of our 2018 uh, PBCD fellow, Joyce, Joy Simeon, uh, who is a PhD student there at Texas A&M. And it was just a delight to work with Joy in preparing this research. Um, as uh, Ben mentioned, in addition to Joy, we have two other speakers today. Um, our uh, speaker, um, we have a local speaker there from the Houston area uh, who is Rick uh, 
uh, Flanagan, who is the emergency management coordinator for the city of Houston. Uh, in addition to Rick, we also have a professor there at Texas A&M, um, and that is Dr. John Cooper Thomas, uh, who you will hear from shortly. But before we begin with our other two speakers, I wanted just to provide some brief information as it relates to the city of Houston. Uh, Joy may have covered a little bit of this uh, in her presentation, but just as a means of um, making sure that um, individuals understand the dynamic uh, city that is Houston and the greater Houston area, um, I thought it was important to share some basic information on the city. Um, as you can see, it is a sprawling city. Uh, Houston was incorporated in 1837. Uh, currently, the population estimate is around uh, 2.3 million, and it represents the fourth largest city in the United States. I'm just going to minimize. Uh, let me just uh, minimize my screen for a moment. Uh, and then it is obviously the largest city in the uh, state of Texas. There we go. Um, as it relates to land area, uh, Houston is a sprawling 636 square miles. And in addition to land area, they represent almost 30 miles of water area. Uh, making it just shy of 700 square miles. The racial makeup includes 58% uh, white. Uh, black. The black population there in the city is about 20, 23%. Um, and then the next largest group, or the, the second largest group, would be Hispanic of any race, around 44%. Uh, no doubt Houston is, is fairly diverse uh, in terms of its racial makeup. Uh, in terms of the number of households within the city, and this is actual city proper, uh, between 2012-2016, there were reported 831,000 uh, households within the entire city of Houston. And as it relates to the percent of residents in poverty, uh, it's right at uh, 22%. And this, is, of course, was information that was conveyed uh, through the U.S. Census Bureau with an update. Um, Joy may have touched on a little bit of this information related to the hurricane itself, um, but uh, just kind of as a quick review, Hurricane Harvey began forming in the Atlantic Ocean uh, around August, uh, mid-August in 2017. Um, at its peak, uh, it, it, uh, the date was around August 25th, uh, and then it dissipated, uh, fortunately, uh, around September 2nd, uh, 2017, right around Labor Day. Um, at its highest level, it was a Category 4 hurricane. Uh, it's known as one of the costliest hurricanes on record, uh, recording uh, recently as $125 billion that it had cost the uh, United States and, and other countries as well. The lives lost uh, are at least 106 confirmed deaths in the United States and then one confirmed death in the Caribbean. Uh, the highest wind sustained a uh, maximum per hour of 130. Uh, and in terms of its overall uh, impact, at least 30,000 people, particularly here in the United States, were displaced. And of those, 17,000 had to be uh, rescued. Um, as it relates to uh, the hurricane itself. Uh, so just understanding the, the context of the city of Houston and understanding the hurricane itself, I want to now uh, introduce um, our first, our second speaker, I should say, uh, and that is uh, none other than Rick Flanagan. Uh, and Rick has a long civil service history uh, there at the city of Houston. He initially, um, was involved uh, with and worked for a number of years for the city's fire department. Uh, in fact, Rick worked for the fire department for about 34 years before he retired, uh, and he retired as executive assistant chief for support 
Uh, just briefly, as it relates to his background, in his role, he oversaw the fire department's information technology infrastructure, uh, human resources, and member support. Uh, but Rick, inter interestingly, also uh, was involved um, with Hurricane Katrina, uh, and he played an active role and key role in many emergency responses throughout his, in throughout his career, including acting as Deputy Area Commander for Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. Uh, and so it is at this point now I want to turn over uh, the presentation to Rick, uh, and as a part of Rick's presentation, I came up with a couple, six or so questions that I, I thought would be helpful for him to kind of uh, direct his attention to and talk about the impact of Hurricane Harvey on the city of Houston. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Rick. Okay. Uh, well, first I'll say thank you very much. Uh, in situations like this of managing these, these events, uh, one of the main things that we do is that we pay close attention and work diligently with the National Weather Service. So our monitoring process is the beginning phase of this storm as, as an outlier. Uh, so this starts days ahead. So as, uh, cut, make things short and simple or keep it short and simple. Uh, once we identify the pathway of the hurricane, we then started to put out our messaging. And then we have what we uh, the confirm as our unified command. And we get first start with all of our department members and directors of each division. And we get them together so that we can get a clear understanding of their assets, assets that we'll use, and anything that we might need as a replacement or, or what we call unmet needs. So once we identify those assets, we start pushing out information of the res responsibility, mainly from fire, police, and public works. Uh, what role they will play. So they tr we move them ahead and get their families orchestrated so they can move them out of harm's way. And so then we come back in and make pr our preparations for the storm. So the city's in readiness and assessment of all of the departments and assets that they have. We move equipment around the city. And at the same time, on a daily basis, three times a day, we are monitoring the weather conditions. So as we looked at the pathway of the storm, the direct impact of the storm came in at Rockport and then it makes landfall. And we know that once these storms make landfall, they start to subside. So coming in at Rockport, and so now we're talking about how we process and start putting information out to the community. What the message was in Rockport was distinctly different from what the messaging was in the city of Houston. So in Rockport, we're telling people that they should evacuate and leave that area because of the impact of the storms. But at the, the weather forecast that we were receiving, that this was going to be a tremendous rain event and not so much of a wind event. So with that being the overview, our messaging was totally different. We were saying we can shelter in place, people can possibly stay within their homes, and we could probably withstand this. But little did we know that Mother Nature was going to put a twist in the process, and we were going to get this substantial rainstorm, almost some 50-something, 50 52 inches of rain, and it was very devastating. So when you talk about the magnitude of that 2.3 million people in the city of Houston and the diversity that we have, when we talk about the African-American community, we're talking about the high probability is that there's not a father figure in most of those families. So our messaging is out. We're, we put out our general community messaging about build, have a plan, build a kit, stay informed, know your neighbors, take care of your food so you can sustain yourself to five to seven days. If you think that you need to probably move out of harm's way or will probably be impacted and you'll need electricity or something like that, it would be best to properly relocate. So these are all part of the equations that we put in trying to, to communicate to the general public what would be the best thing that they can do. So we, we push that information out first. And now when the storm impacts us, not only was it a 100-year storm that was dynamically different, you're talking about a rain capacity that has never been seen before. And so, first of all, we live in the hurricane belt, so we've been through this process several times. But this particular time, the rain impact was so significant that it inundated the city. It inundated the city from what our resources were, and it just made a brand new model for us to study and move forward. So that is the, what I'll probably leave that factor and, and, and back away from the preparation activities. I mean, and now we'll get a little bit more in that communication piece. So the communication piece is that we still are doing these day-to-day -day briefings three times a day so that we can get information and intel about what's impacted, where we're going to apply resources, what backup resources that we need, and that funding model because we're, we have a burn rate of using equipment, 
personnel and staffing and fooding and relocation and preparing and looking for possibilities we can open up different shelter locations all this is just a time mechanism that continues to go on and on and on so we're trying to make sure that we can communicate to the public what the status of the condition of the storm is how much longer we might be inundated we've got units that are out there that are patrolling they're affecting rescues one of the unique factors we found out when you talk about what's the new horizon in managing emergency events is that the the process or the, or the program that we talk about is the CERT program, and the CERT program is really is, is so important, is that it's a group of citizens that come together in the general community, and they're being trained on how they can engage in assisting people. Now, when you talk about that 2.3, about 12,000, 5,000 is police, 4,000 is fire, and about 2,000 plus are public works. That's not enough to spread around from over 600 something square miles to affect the assistance in rescuing people. So that uh, community emergency response team, that CERP training really became a very valuable tool for us. And you'll see that this has been around for years and I think that's gonna be the cornerstone to manage emergencies in the future moving moving forward. They play such a vital role because, believe it or not, we're really not the first responders because the first responders are going to be, people, be the people in the neighborhood. So now we know how to better manage that. And so that communication piece of what assets that they may need, where are we picking people up, moving them to drop-off sites, and then moving them from the drop, or we call the lily pads where we're dropping people off. We move those people to shelters. We found out that the rain was so intense, we would open up a shelter. We would have to close that shelter because the waters continued to rise. So it was a continual management process, and the communication is the cornerstone to any of your manage, management uh, process or processes in, in any aspect of managing an emergency or any event that has any significant impact to your city or, or the jurisdictions in which you live. The final piece I want to get into is what we call the post-recovery, and what are some of the things that we learn there? Well, when you have that inundation, and uh, I I can't remember the lady's name for A and M, but she did a very good presentation, and she mentioned about the impact of how these homes were and and buildings were impacted. You have to go in and remove this debris out. Uh, you have to tear tear certain levels of your sheetrock out so that you can. Can you can stop the potential uh, mold that builds up, and you can have an opportunity to probably have a good assessment and find out what you can do to rebuild your property. But at the same time as you remove that debris, we have to get it off the streets because it becomes a health hazard. And when you talk about that many communities and the number of populations that we have, we don't have enough as a structured entity for as uh, debris removal that we can move all that so you have to have contracts with other cities that can come in and help you out to get those things out of the way and so when we look at that as how important it is we're looking now for a damage assessment we're looking for assistance from FEMA to come in and to assist us and also too we're trying to make sure that we put out information to the general public so they can be wary about what contractors should be doing and what they should not be doing so that they can make sure that they put their plans together that the city now has made has got all the information of the impact and how it's impacted them and they're making sure that they will abide by the city ordinance of rebuilding these homes which jettisons us to the new city ordinance for those certain areas that were impacted you have have to elevate your home no longer can you rebuild it as it was before so the mitigation piece is a cornerstone of this in the end is truly important uh, mitigation piece really goes a little bit beyond just a home and community. It goes into the thoroughfares about your bayous or how, how they need to be widened and open, how you should probably rebuild certain buildings and, and move your generators up. There are just so many things that you have to put into that process of reevaluating. So it becomes very important, and I honestly want to say it's just an endless process, and you'll learn something at every one of these storms. Great. Uh, thank you for that, Rick. And we certainly appreciate your perspective from the city of Houston. Um, I think many of us were watching TV and watching the news and watching the hurricane coverage, and we were praying for um, it to be, you know, least impactful to the, that Gulf that Gulf um, uh, Gulf area and that region. Um, because we realized that there are so many people that live in the area, uh, and we had hoped that there had been the proper 
um, planning and preparation to make sure that people were being moved to a higher ground or, or some shelter area. So it's great to hear uh, about the resiliency that the city had in place for that. Um, I'd I just like to impart one thing before you, know, you back away from me is that one thing when we talk about hurricanes is mainly the wind conditions. We talk about the category, and it was a Cat 4 when it made landfall in Rockport. But as I, I mentioned to you, it started to subside. Could you imagine how bad this would have been if we'd have still had the wind conditions like we've had before? I've, I've been with the city now almost 40 years. And in 1983, we had Hurricane Alicia that impacted the city, and we had to close downtown because it annihilated all of the high-rise building windows, and it becomes charged and charged of glass to continue to fly. So imagine how, how much worse this would have been if we'd have had the wind capacities to also be a part of the, the rain capacities that impacted the city as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's transition now to our next speaker, and that is going to be John Thomas Cooper, Jr., Ph.D. Uh, John is Associate Professor of Practice, uh, specifically working as the Texas Target Communities Director at Texas A&M University. I'm not quite sure how they're doing this well in football season, but I'm sure he'll give us an update. Uh, in addition to uh, Texas Target Communities, uh, he has affiliations with Hazard Reduction and Recovery Center. Uh, the de he act obviously works in the Department of Landscape Architecture and Planning there at the university and the Center for Housing and Urban Development. Uh, by way of education, John received a Bachelor of Arts degree in Economics from Texas A&M. And, and in 1992, he joined many of us planners by earning a master's degree in urban planning from Texas A&M, and eventually a PhD uh, in city and regional planning from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2004. Um, and so with that, uh, I would like to turn it over to Professor Cooper, and um, I have some targeted questions for him uh, related to uh, past and current research regarding hazard mitigation and planning, and what does he see as the future of this field and where are we headed and what are some of the current leading studies? Thanks, Derek. So, uh, yeah, again, my name is John Cooper. Uh, I am uh, also Assistant Vice President for Public Partnership and Outreach here at Texas A&M. That's my day-to-day my -day job. But uh, as you mentioned, I am a uh, the director of the Texas Target Communities Program, which is an initiative aimed at helping small towns, rural communities, um, um, neighborhoods or communities within urban places like Houston get access to uh, help from planning faculty and students on economic development, uh, comprehensive planning endeavors, uh, and so forth. And, and I am a professor of the practice in the urban planning program, um, although uh, I, I, I've only been back in the university uh, since 2012. Before then, I worked for a nonprofit based in North Carolina, doing a lot of community um, community engagement, community development work. My dissertation work was on the extent to which marginalized populations are accounted for in disaster planning. And I looked at a national sample of disaster plans, uh, uh, trying to discover uh, the extent to which, uh, uh, again, marginalized populations are included in the planning, the, the level of commitment from local planners and emergency managers uh, to um, do inclusive planning. I got to tell you, I, I I didn't find a whole lot, and I'll come back to that uh, towards the end. Um, over the last uh, 20, 25 years or so, since I finished my master's degree, I've also um, I also did a stint with the North Carolina Division of Emergency Management as a uh, planning specialist and um, 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 project coordinator for the state's hazard mitigation uh, grant program after Hurricane Fran in 1996. So over the last 20, 25 years or so, I've, I've been writing, kind of researching, working, uh, doing and being uh, in the hazard uh, mitigation and community uh, planning space. Um, you know, your question too, uh, I thought was uh, interesting. I haven't been asked that, but I got to tell you as an, uh, as a, I'm going to say a an academic academician that kind of dabbles in research and <laughs> dabbles in practice as well. Uh, what was my reaction to Hurricane Harvey and its impact to, to Houston? I can tell you, as, as, as Hurricane Harvey was looming, 
uh, my gut reaction was, uh, you know, here we go again, right? Uh, Joy, I heard her say that uh, her uh, her talk, her study was exploratory, uh, but I got to tell you, as I was listening, uh, I, I couldn't help but feel like, you know, we've heard these stories uh, before. Uh, Katrina was the first time that I think some of these issues were brought to the nation's uh, attention, but in, in my own research and practice uh, over time, uh, I, I learned that uh, there was plenty of evidence before Hurricane Katrina that uh, certain populations experience a kind of a disproportionate impact from disasters. I, I found studies, uh, or I, I should say stories, in my doctoral work that uh, went as far back as the, uh, uh, the fire that destroyed San Francisco. Um, I talk a lot about uh, uh, Princeville, North Carolina, after Hurricane Floyd in 1999. I don't know, many of you might have heard of Princeville. If you haven't, look it up. It's the oldest surviving uh, uh, town incorporated by African Americans in the, U in the United States that's still surviving. And it was literally founded on the banks of the Tar River, where the um, uh, newly freed slaves went to seek the safety and, and rest refuge of a, of a Union Army encampment. They built the town on the banks of that river, and, and by 1999, it didn't flood nine times. And so, um, you know, as an academician and a researcher, I, 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 I hear these stories, and I think, uh, again, you know, here, here we go again. Um, yet, you know, by, by definition, disasters are things you can't totally prepare for. As Rick said, you know, the rain in Hurricane Harvey was extraordinary. Right. This is this is something that, despite all we know about past disasters, despite all the the history that we've had in the Gulf Coast with disasters, uh, we weren't quite ready for the rain. Uh, uh, you know, but uh, the 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 way that certain populations have fared after disaster, I I, I think was totally predictable. Uh, and and this kind of relates to your third question, based on current research. Um, you know, is there a difference? in African American neighborhoods versus other neighborhoods, uh, and, and so what is that difference? I, I feel like there is a there are entire bodies of knowledge just on these subjects, just the way the media reports on stor studies uh, stories and disasters, and, and the inequities related to recovery programs and so forth. I can remember taking a course when I was a master's student on the media and disasters, and we learned about how uh, the media can. Um, manipulate <laughs> images. Uh, we talked about the Loma Prieta earthquake and, and how <clears throat> on TV we would see images of uh, destroyed buildings where if just if the camera person had swung the camera around, there was no other devastation on that street. Uh, and so media seeks to, to, to fill a void. It's the same thing with uh, uh, a lot of stories about uh, the way uh, crowds react in disasters. We, 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 we are fearful of mobs, but if you look into uh, mob behavior. Uh, some of my sociologists or friends will tell you there, there's there's some rationale to that sometimes, and so um, I, I won't dig uh, into the complexities of all those things because that's that's not really uh, what, what what I'm an expert in. Uh, what, what I can say though is based on my research and experience is that uh, I feel like uh, uh, pre-disaster planning um, uh, is the key <clears throat> to um, um, a stronger community fabric. And greater resilience, uh, kind of in response to disasters. And, and the fact is, is, is very, very hard, if not impossible, to be thoughtful, um, you know, strategic, ju judicious, equitable, fair, whatever you want to say, in the midst of of, of chaos. Uh, and so I, I, I kind of feel like um, what we do as planners, if if we can get ahead of it, pre-disaster planning, I'm talking about specifically, uh, we can do a lot to minimize the impacts of disasters on, on the places that we care most about. Um, let's see, where climate change. All right, so um, although I haven't uh, been a, a dyed-in-the-wool academician uh, for the last 20 years, I, I have had the privilege to, to hang around with a lot of uh, people who are steeped in their research and their work, and, and, and I've hung out with a lot of, uh, I'm just going to say, older people, <laughs> more experienced researchers who believe strongly in what their research is telling them about the influence of climate change and, and weather uh, conditions uh, in events like Hurricane Harvey. And, and, and I trust those folks. Uh, one of the things I, uh, anybody who's, who's working on a PhD, uh, if, if you go to a reputable place, you're taught uh, 
how to be uh, discriminate. You, you're taught how to uh, kind of to, to be critical. Uh, and, and the folks that I trust who've been doing the climate change research for, for decades tell me that uh, this is playing a role. So I, I tend to try to uh, avoid getting in, into the weeds on climate change discussions, lest I be, uh, uh, you know, revealed as, as a fraud. But uh, uh, the people I trust say it's a factor, and I believe it. I'm just going to uh, leave it at, at that. Um, where is hazard mitigation planning headed? And what are the leading studies? You know, I hope it's headed towards more inclusiveness. This this is what my work has been about over the last 20 years. Uh, uh, I decided not to go into the academy because in my dissertation work, I, I concluded that even when emergency managers believe in the value of inclusive planning, it's, it's not something that they are skilled at doing. Uh, they are typically trained in top-down um, models of decision making, the incident control uh, uh, or incident command system, uh, which which is good. I, you know, I, I came for that. I was a professional emergency planner. Planner. My dad was a emergency medical technician. So uh, uh, those kinds of systems, those kinds of ways of making decisions, uh, have a time and place. But when you're talking about uh, long term. Uh, planning for resilience and community readiness, you, may, you need more of a community uh, building approach. And so uh, where I hope hazard mitigation planning is, is headed uh, more in that direction. As far as uh, leading studies, uh, you know, most of my work has been on the um, quality of mitigation plans. That is, you know, to, to what extent do mitigation plans e e exhibit you know, the highest standards of planning? Um, and uh, I've also, you know, looked at the commitment of planners to doing uh, planning in an inclusive way. Uh, so for me, uh, that kind of stuff is always uh, um, worth looking into. Um, some of my colleagues here, Phil Burke, um, Jamie Masterson, and others, have been doing work on uh, what 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 I think uh, I describe as the network of plans. That is, how does your hazard mitigation plan and your comprehensive uh, plan or elements of your comprehensive plan, housing, uh, 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 transportation, infrastructure, how do those things uh, complement or conflict with each other? Uh, uh, is your mitigation plan calling for a moratorium on development in the flood zones or um, uh, where, whereas your uh, development plan is calling for a river walk? You know, uh, so uh, they're doing some innovative work uh, in, in that regard. Um, I, I want to direct folks to the uh, Hazard Reduction and Recovery Center Center's website for more information about the the kind of work that's happening here at Texas A&M through uh, not only Phil Burke but some other folks, uh, Dr. Shannon Van Zant, Walt Peacock, and and a lot of other people. Um, in addition to that, uh, there is a uh, uh, Coastal Hazard Center of Excellence at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, and I'm on the advisory board for. There's a lot of innovative stuff happening uh, there, and I, I direct folks to just go in and, and check that out. Um, so, uh, you know, in, in lieu of just going on talking about myself, I, I, I see that we are uh, coming close to the uh, end of the hour, and I, I'm, I'm curious as to what questions folks in the audience have. Derek, is it is it okay if I kind of yield the remainder of my time to uh, get into more what people in the audience want to know about? Absolutely, and, and that was going to be the next segue into the actual webinar. So we were going to conclude with your presentation. We've heard from our researcher. Uh, we've heard from our expert from the city of Houston, and now we've heard from also a professor there at the university. And so now it's this opportunity for those who are who are um, taking a part of the, the webinar here to ask some general questions. Those will be filled through our um, person on the other end that is that is facilitating the discussions. And so at this point, we would ask, if you have any questions, send those uh, to us, and then uh, we can read them on the screen as they come available. OK, and Derek, there's one more thing I want to say before we get there. And, and I'd like Joy to, to say more about the Bill Anderson Fund. And in particular, as it relates to research, there's, there's a, uh, a newly minted uh, PhD at the University of Maryland, Marcus Hend Hendricks, who's, who's doing some great stuff. He's in, in great demand. He's a he's a great thinker. I, I think uh, he's a person that folks uh, ought to want to keep an eye on.
Sounds good. Okay. Joy? <laughs> um, so, uh, in addition to the Robert A. Catlin Fellowship that I was awarded this summer, um, for the last year, I've had the opportunity to be a DAF Fellow, which is a Bill Anderson uh, Fund Fellow. It was named after Bill Anderson, who was a hazard specialist who really promoted um, getting minorities involved in hazard research. And so the idea behind this fellowship is to allow minority students, especially those um, who specialize or are going into PhD programs, to really come in and um, be exposed to different hazard specialists, uh, planning advisory um, teams, and learn the skill sets that we wouldn't have otherwise um, and not awarded this opportunity. So it's a really great program. Great. Thank you, Joy. So at this time, for those who are tuned into the webinar, if you have any burning questions from any of our speakers, uh, feel free to send those, uh, and then we will read them and, and direct them to the appropriate person. Okay, Derek, this has been, I've got a, a series of questions and also a couple of observations. Um, you know, here in, in the Northeast, um, I'm th thinking back to Tropical Storm Irene, which uh, simply devastated parts of uh, the state of Vermont, our neighbor uh, from here in New Hampshire. And my my recollection of, um, you know, in addition to the overall uh, damage, which was mostly because of uh, intensive rainfall that followed upon a period of ground saturation because of uh, ongoing rain, uh, the, the enormous amount of flooding that occurred really impacted in particular upon um, uh, low-income population living in manufactured housing communities, uh, which had been uh, located in areas that would have been susceptible to this sort of thing. And I think, you know, this, this is kind of a universal message of, of this webcast. Uh, we need to think carefully about uh, the choices that we as planners make in deciding where things should go or helping people to decide where things should go. Um, and we, we uh, I think sometimes, you know, um, Hurricane Harvey is a case in point, as is uh, Hurricane Florence, too. Um, uh, earlier in, in South Carolina, North Carolina, the amount of rain that, that fell really impacted low-income communities uh, tremendously. So we have, we have a, a lot of work to do. And we have a series of questions here, so I'll get to them. Um, starting off with a question for Joy. Um, this, this question comes from Krishna. It has to do with the uh, the media coverage uh, of uh, that uh, took place in, in Houston. And Krishna is asking, um, uh, the African-American neighborhoods were mentioned 43% of the time in news articles. Uh, do you consider that an underrepresentation of coverage uh, because of the 56% mentioned of other neighborhoods? I do consider it an underrepresentation, um, primarily because when they mentioned them, it was in passing and not directly saying, okay, uh, this Sunnyside neighborhood, which is an African American neighborhood in Houston, um, was directly impacted. It was more of like, uh, we took a picture of this African American neighborhood and mentioned this word and that was it. So whenever they mention um, either white neighborhoods or even sometimes Hispanic neighborhoods, they went into great detail of what was going on there. The images match. Um, so in that case, I do find that it was underrepresented a lot, and especially the way that it was even viewed on um, the television. Okay, thanks. Uh, here's a question for John, uh, also from Krishna. Are there any uh, comparative studies on the impacts on economically poorer areas? Uh, black, brown, or white, as compared to affluent areas, policy and capital programming issues, uh, things like that? I'm sure there are. And um, there's a person who I know who does this kind of work, and, and, and her name is escaping me right now, so I have to apologize. So I, the, the short answer is yes, and I'll have to get back to you with specifically on who, who does that kind of work. Who, Derek, okay. are, who's taking names uh, to follow up on? We'll, well, we can post for, uh, we some can of the questions and the responses on uh, the Planning of Black Community Divisions webpage. And I'll make okay. sure that Derek gets all of the questions uh, with, so that you can follow up uh, directly with people who are asking them to. Uh, Sorry, here's a Krishna, question. hit me up later. 
Here's a here's a question from Gordon. Uh, has post storm research found that historic and contemporary land use regulations significantly contributed to the extensive flooding impacts of Hurricane Harvey? Was that Who would that question, question be directed to? It, I, 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 it might go to Rick or to John or to Joy. I mean, uh, uh, have well, a way at it. Well, long just for just a shot at it, uh, the mitigation piece plays a very vital role. Once you have the impact, you have an opportunity to see what was impacted and how you can rectify the the problem itself, and this, which is one of the factors here in the Houston area. Uh, in the late 80s, their segment of Houston on the south side was the Sagemont area where you get into the NASA community, and it used to flood all the time. And they had a major project that they had pushed in the early 90s to widen Sims Bayou, which would control the, the flow of water out of that community. And it was truly effective. So the plans had moved forward. And I think we just kind of got caught in the time span to address the other mitigation plans for the other multiple bayous in the city. The other thing or other factor for Houston is the, the topography of Houston. Houston is very flat. Uh, and so there is, we just don't have that terrain that really could probably help in some sense. So those things are very important. The mitigation piece and looking at that subterrain and how you manage it, uh, if, which is another factor too, is that now the new ordinance has a strict policy when you now you're building buildings or high-rise buildings that you have to build or consider a retention pond type of drainage to help the, the process along. And my, and my response to that is uh, I'm sure the folks who are on this call are aware of uh, the, um, the the history of planning and, and land use. And, and I'll just say that, that uh, not just in the South, but also uh, in, in places outside the South, there are, there are only so many places that African Americans in particular could live. And oftentimes those are in the floodplains. Uh, I think uh, over uh, in the past, uh, those uh Contexts have been uh, set up uh, intentionally. I think uh, today it'd be harder to to say that uh, um, the disproportionate uh, risk is distributed uh, by intention. Um, but you know, uh, these things don't happen in in, in a vacuum, right? There, we got the context that we have, and in, in, in the conditions, the forces, the uh, whatever led to the, the historical context has given us what we have today. And then there are some actions that we can take today that we are taking today that exacerbate uh, old issues, right? Uh, so, I mean, if you look at the story of Princeville, um, they built a town uh, on the banks of the river. Frankly, there was no place else they could build it, right? That would be acceptable uh, to the other folks. Right, so whether the, whether, uh, the, the um issue is from intent or neglect, the result is the same. Um, we've got a, a following up on this, actually, we have a question uh, from Simone uh, regarding the, you know, Houston is famous for its uh, lack of zoning. And so she asks, how has the built environment and lack of zoning in Houston impacted vulnerability to hurricanes and other weather events? Well, I, I can honestly tell you it mixes commodities. And so really we know that zoning truly helps. The, the criteria for Houston is called deed restriction. And so the deed restriction is, is a process, but it's starting to have a, a, a modern day approach moving forward. Uh, and they have now have, they still are liable for different commodities to be mixed in communities, which zoning doesn't. And so now they're making a hardcore effort that whatever you bring in, you're gonna have to orchestrate a plan in that, in, in that uh, proposal that you can address the drainage because the one thing that we definitely looked at more concrete, uh, more more flooding, so it just doesn't have a chance for the water to subside. So that's in the equation as we move forward. Okay, and I've got a question here for Joy. Um, when conducting your phase three work, you mentioned you found a high percentage of damaged homes that were occupied by the elderly. In the midst of collecting this data, did you come across any data on whether those elderly persons suffered from chronic diseases? Um, as we know, uh, these can be exacerbated by the adverse effects of hurricane disasters. 
Yeah, so one of the interviews that I did, um, a lady was ta- talked about how her next door neighbor um, was impacted by the floods and had to be evacuated out of the storm um, after like all the raining and stuff. And so at the, I think it was six months later, he ended up dying because of like so much stress on his heart and ended up having a heart attack. And then I think three months before that, his wife died. So a lot of that is what they call indirect um, impacts. And so I saw like stories after stories um, throughout those interviews of those kind of impacts. Okay, and so this is for for John um, from Jennifer. Universities have a great deal of talent, data, and resources. I'm interested in how Texas A&M is supporting local planning efforts to recover and rebuild, that is data, community engagement, and so on. Great short question, and, and that's actually my, my job um, as director of Texas Target Communities and assistant vice president for public partnership and outreach. Uh, I am, uh, I, first of all, I go where I'm invited, and obviously there was a lot of devastation across the um, southeast of Texas, and only so much um, so much uh, I can do uh, in Texas Target Communities is me, and uh, I have an associate director, Jamie Masterson, and we have one full-time program manager. The most the rest of the, the, the work that we do is uh, with the help of student workers and uh, faculty and capstone or, you know, studio courses in, in the planning and landscape uh, architecture uh, program. Uh, that said, um, we, on average, try to work with at least uh, two places a year. Um, Hurricane Harvey made landfall in Rockport. I think Rick, Rick, Rick mentioned that. Uh, and Rockport is one of the places that we are doing a comprehensive plan um, in uh, this year. Uh, another place is uh, uh, Hitchcock, which happens to be in the same district where we had the mass uh, school shooting uh, in Texas, uh, just north of Galveston. So they, in the course of a year, they had the school shooting and then they had Hurricane Harvey. So uh, we're working with uh, Hitchcock and Rockport and uh, trying to uh, help out in Port Arthur, uh, although, you know, the the, the 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 scope of work there is, is kind of still uh, under development. So that said, um, I am situated at Texas A&M College Station, but, but Texas A&M is part of a university system that also includes Prairie View A&M, uh, Texas A&M Galveston, Texas A&M Corpus. Uh, I don't limit uh, uh, my reach just to faculty and students on this campus, wherever I can provide assistance, wherever I can broker relationships between places that reach out to me uh, and uh, my, our, our uh, uh, campuses in the TAMU system, I, I try to do that. Um, and surprisingly, uh, this uh, we don't see enough of this. There are associations, service learning, um, 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 university engagement programs that are getting more attention, but th- th- there's still not a lot of it done. And uh, I don't want to say uh, I'm an innovator. Um, I, I certainly don't think I'm the only one, but I, I think there needs to be more folks um, doing what we do. Great, thank you. So here's a question for, for Rick uh, from Victoria. Um, how did or does the city of Houston decide uh, or determine the placement of temporary debris sites for hazardous and household wastes? How many of these were placed in African-American or low-income communities, particularly uh, such sites that brought waste from more affluent communities into African-American and low-income communities? No, those were moved to the uh, corporate disposal sites. Uh, they didn't have any temporary sites. We'd had a history in the past that they had orchestrated plans such as that, and a lot of those were near some of the African-American communities. And the meetings that followed, that was one of the main concerns. So I, I will say that I would, I would tip the government structure for the city of Houston from using past history to know some of the things not to do. So that, that was really averted, and thank God for the past history. That's good to hear. Um, Here's, I'm not sure who this would be for, but I'll just read it off. This is from John. Um, what has been the strategy or approach for disaster preparation pertaining to evacuation for African-American communities that are at extreme threats to major events as communities are as these communities are traditionally settled in floodplains or other coastal low-lying areas? Uh, 
You may have to read that one again. Yeah, and this 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 is not necessarily just about Houston, um, and not necessarily just about African American communities too, but more, uh, I'd say, focus on on low income communities. Um, the question is, what has been the strategy or approach for disaster preparation pertaining to evacuation for African American communities that are at extreme threats to major events? I'm going to put Rick on the spot, Rick. I'm going to say that sounds more like a Rick question. Okay, so what what we've done, uh, we've looked at the impact of the lack of mobility, especially in the in the African American communities or minority communities, and there are just a lot of families throughout the city itself that don't have access. So there is a state program for the state of Texas is called um, it's called STEER is the acronym the State of Texas Emergency Registry uh, Alert Registry Assistant Registry and so what they do on an annual basis I think it starts in March uh, each year they 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 refresh new downloads for people that don't that have mobility problems that don't have vehicles and you can register with STEER. And when we are doing those out, outlying days prior to the storm making landfall, we're calling those persons and telling them where we will pick them up and we will move those people to San Antonio, Austin, and Dallas uh, as our pre-plan. Okay, thanks. So here's a question from Donna. Again, I'm not exactly sure who would best be suited to answer this, but she asks, how do you think FEMA policy affects redevelopment after hurricane? Do you think it would be helpful to have a national policy that addresses rebuilding or relocating away from or off or out of flood zones and barrier islands? Or do you think states should handle their own redevelopment? You, you know, I, I, I'm just going to uh, hop in on this, but I, I honestly think that's such a legislative question, uh, mainly because you're, you're then talking about a tax infrastructure that the cities are are basically looking at and so how do you govern that moving forward now there are buyouts as proposed plans in some inundated areas so that's that's a part of the uh, overview that the city and the county gets together about how do you affect it and you got to remember when you affect a buyout in a certain area uh, those people probably that were in that affected area are concerned but you got to remember there's also the the, the overflow in a certain boundaries that affect some other people that they're not going to be inside that that defined uh, uh, di uh, dimensions that as they're laid out, so that causes a little pain. So it, it's kind of uh, it's kind of complicated in a sense to satisfy everybody. But even when you do it, you have to have plans to how do you utilize the property moving forward, uh, because it could impact the the the, the aesthetics of a community. Um, and a lot of times, there are some people that just don't want to move in spite of. So it's hard to say. Uh, moving forward, I think that that's something that the city of Houston is looking at now is that for these areas such as the Myerland areas, which is somewhat in the southeast, uh, mainly south central, uh, Myerland was severely impacted, I mean, over and over and over again, Memorial Day floods, the Halloween Day flood, um, and that runs right adjacent to the Braze Bayou. And so they've been impacted so many times, people are just filled with frustration. And so now the city ordinance says, that if you re rebuild your home, it has to be elevated. And that's a mathematical equation, not only to, to a family, but how do you manage that as a government entity to what role do you play? But over and all, you know, it's the long-term process is that how do you manage this, this structure of, remember, we got to remember from a city standpoint, it's a tax zone or a tax entity. So how do you manage that overall so that you have people that, are delighted to live in the community and they feel protected because the, the city of Houston is doing what they should be doing to protect them. So I just want to also say this, if it's the last thing you ever remember what I might want to share with you, the largest room in the whole wide world is the room for improvement. And we have to stay in that at the universities, we have to stay in that in emergency management, uh, at the government structure as well. That's great advice. And, and Rick, this is uh, also for you. Uh, also from Krishna, what was the role of the storm management division in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey in proposing mitigation? Well, they, they'll propose, they're more or less mathematical equations, and, and they look at the end results in more detail. The other phase of the mitigation is that we put together plans where we hold different meetings throughout the city in the different affected areas so that we can get the citizens to come in and say, 
what are your concerns that we need to table to address mitigation impacts so that we can have some improvements down the road. And so when you lay out this master mitigation plan, they write the plan and the plan is, has an entity time of five years and then they rewrite the plan again. But at the same time, you want to evaluate what was done in the prior five years until the opposed to the to, to the uh, new the, the new new uh, newly assigned year that starts off. So in the new uh, new open year uh, for that time span, you open up for the new, next five years. What did you successfully do on the previous five years? So it it goes hand in hand. It's it's a it's a continuous process. But one thing that's so important is that we have to have the general community's input. Believe it or not, a lot of these communities where African Americans live, they want to live there. They don't want to move. We have a lot of families that have lived there over 50 and 70 years, generations following a generation. So uh, it's one thing for to, to be mindful is that we want to hear what your concerns are. And the one thing we want to do, as I mentioned to you earlier, we want to listen to your concerns and make the improvements so you can really enjoy where you live and live where you where you desire to live. And, and, and I, I think there's an underlying message in what Rick just said, and it, and it sort of relates to the question Donna asked before, which I think is a great question, but uh, uh, Rick's answer kind of illustrates the complexity in, in giving a response to that. But but I think as 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 far as planners go, I think the better we are at the design and execution of planning programs that draw out the community voice, I think uh, the better the outcomes will be. And I think uh, I, I think the our legislators, state, you know, and, and, and national will start to pick up on that. Um, in, in my time, I've, I've encountered many people uh, working at FEMA who who get it, uh, but whose hands are tied. And oftentimes they they have to um, uh, pay you know give deference to to folks at the states. But but I, I think the, the message to planners is um, we overall need to get better at uh, our ability to design and execute inclusive planning programs, programs that uh, that that seek draw out meaningful and incorporate the voice of the community. And let me just piggyback and just say we're talking about this storm conditions, but when we talk about the phenomenon around the country. For those people who live in the south area here in Texas, in the Houston area, we're accustomed to the hurricanes that come here. But look what happens to those that live in California, and, and they have the big big fires and the landslides. And uh, I mean, there's, so, there's problematic factors all around the country. And somehow we get acclimated to living here, and, and we don't want to go anywhere else. But one thing we have to do is that every opportunity we get, every storm that we face, we should put provisions, have plans to improve what we've gone through and make it better. Absolutely. Hey, Ben, this is Derek. Let's take yes. maybe two more questions and then we can do a wrap up. Okay. Here's here's a question from Ashley. Um, uh, what efforts were made in public education after the storm about structure safety, mold removal, uh, filing for assistance, et cetera? She said, we have a difficult time disseminating information to impoverished communities because of their relative lack of access to mobile sources of information, such as phones. We, we largely rely on social media, uh, first responders to share information, shelters to spread information, news media to share links to sites and location for information, and word of mouth. Uh, she's asked, are there any aha, excellent methods to disseminate uh, education after disaster? Was that, that a question to the group? Or? That is a question to the group, whoever. Um, you know, this really is how, how do we communicate, how do we get the word out after disaster about the resources that are available and the hazards and the, the ongoing hazards post a disaster? Uh, how do we communicate with low-income communities? So we, so we know the, the common denominator now is the new technology platforms. And we know that that's a high caliber platform for a lot of people to use. But you can't consider that everybody is engaged on the new platform of technology. And so we found out when you know FEMA rolls out, everybody feels as though that, fine, you can go online and you can just log on and put your information in. Well, not everybody has a laptop, not everybody has a computer. Uh, you would be, be surprised that that doesn't happen in a lot of these low-income neighborhoods. So we still have to understand that that system that we've orchestrated still serves a vital purpose. So you can't diminish that 
probably to the to your to your mindset that you think that the the process of what you and what you intend is the norm that everybody has access they don't not only that there, there's a literacy issue for some of the people too so people still need help don't abandon those things that you used before but sharpen the tools that you use now and and i would i would just say that you know in in my experience um i found that where there are trusted community based intermediaries in um, in disaster impacted places, th th those are the ones that you want to interface with. They are the ones who are um, again trusted in the community, have a track record of working in the community, um, and they are the places that the folks who are um, most in need turn to anyway. They are the uh, safety net in communities. So if you if you can find those places, I would try to disseminate messages through through, through those. Uh, and, and you know, it's NGOs, it's uh, civic association. It could be like in Houston, uh, uh, neighborhood associations, uh, uh, churches, of course. But uh, the folks who are uh, know the context, the uh, indigenous uh, people, if you will. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Because you'd be surprised how many elders that still live alone, and they do need some help. <laughs> And piggybacking off of what Dr. Cooper just said, um, I did my thesis on disaster education, but not post-storm, but pre-storm. And one of the greatest assets that um, was a really good resource for me was the churches, um, some of those community organizations, and the like the representatives who worked hand on hand um, with those community members. They were a really good help. I would just add that uh, while you are reaching out to community-based um, intermediaries uh, uh, disseminating information, it's also, also helpful <laughs> to, to let them know that there are certain things that they ought not be doing, right, that that might uh, lead to situations where they're liable for some injury or something like that. Um, uh, after Katrina, uh, the Red Cross and, and FEMA uh, and, and other organizations took a hit because they were, uh, it, it seemed like uh, they didn't know where to go, right? Uh, and so my message to uh, groups I was working with after Katrina was that, you know, there are certain things that you do that you are good at, but then there are other things that uh, is better left to the uh, electric company, you know, like turning on the power. You might organize a cleanup crew who can clear a path to a power line, but the utility company has to turn on the electricity. You might have space to um, uh, house uh, people temporarily, but but you, you got to have permits to or, to serve food, and so uh, this better coordination, I guess, is is what I'm saying, and and help in in, in encouraging people to um, to the as much as possible to stay in their lane. Don't get in their lane. Of course, it, it, unless there's a vacuum and, and and somebody has to do it, then okay. But otherwise, uh, pre-disaster coordination to figure out who does who does what, who's capable of doing what is best. And let me just wrap up with regard to this question. You know, it strikes me that um, I would imagine any type of multifaceted communications approach would work. Because if you think about it and just think about this instance, while people may be readily um, wanting to go to social media, if you have something like a hurricane that's as devastating as Hurricane Harvey, you may not have electricity and you may not have the networks in place to actually allow people to use their social media. I reflect back on doing the news, there were a number of people that couldn't communicate with each other basically through their cell phone because cell phones were and cell towers were impacted by the hurricane. And so it strikes me that I would think post post hurricane or post disaster recovery activities, you have to consider a multifaceted communications approach. So using your traditional social media um, communication forms, but also, if possible, given the, the conditions of the weather, if you can knock on doors and, and check in on neighbors and, and check with other individuals to see if those who may not be able to be upwardly mobile in terms of navigating these types of crises, find out kind of direct communication if 
they've been seen, if they know the whereabouts of, of these individuals. So I would imagine just a, a multifaceted communications approach uh, would probably be the best way. And then to continue to follow up and follow through on that. Let's take one more question, Ben. Okay, this is um, for John. Uh, and recognizing that, you know, uh, disasters are going to happen. Um, it, it seems like uh, this is almost a, a growth industry for planners. So the question is, have schools of planning started offering an elective in hazard mitigation planning? Texas A&M has a certificate uh, for folks who want to focus in hazard mitigation planning. I think, um, you know, after Hurricane Katrina, there were a lot of programs that, that popped up, certificate programs, um, licensing programs. So I think um, there are probably more of them. I haven't done an inventory. That's a good question to see what uh, what the status is across uh, across the landscape. But but I I can assure you that at Texas A and M we 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 include some consideration of of uh, disaster planning, mitigation planning uh, in 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 our offerings here. Uh, every plan that Texas Target Community does for a small town includes a uh, chapter on uh, hazard mitigation planning. So. Uh, it's 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 a core part of what we do here, and I think it's a big part of what uh, what they do back at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, where I got my PhD. So. That's great. That's great. That's great news. It's great information to share. Um, I think it's probably best that we wrap up this uh, the webinar. But before I do, there are a couple of. Um, acknowledgments I want to make. If, in fact, you have an additional question that was not asked, let me provide a, a web uh, email address where you can send in the questions, and I want to make sure I get it right. If you have any additional questions or if you want some additional information regarding the research that was prepared, send an email to info, I-N-F-O, underscore, P-B-C-D, at planning.org. And I'll repeat that, uh, info underscore pbcd at planning.org. Uh, and if you send those questions over, we'll get it to the appropriate uh, presenter and then respond back. Uh, in addition, um, we will make sure that the research project itself is posted onto our website um, so that if individuals want to take a look and read uh, of the research project that Joy prepared, uh, they're able to do so. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't, uh, at this point, uh, first of all, thank uh, Ben Frost, who is our webinar coordinator. Ben, thank you for your work, uh, not only with this particular webinar, but in our past webinars from Planning the Black Community Division. We really appreciate your support, uh, your diligence, uh, and all that you do to help us uh, information out uh, to individuals who are genu genuinely interested in the type of activities and the work and the research that we're doing as a division. Uh, I want to also take a moment to just thank again our presenters, uh, Rick Flanagan of the city of Houston, uh, Dr. Cooper there at Texas A&M, and certainly uh, not least uh, and most importantly, Joy Simeon, who is a PhD student there uh, at Texas A&M University. We truly appreciate your participation today. Um, and it just goes to show you that there really is a, a need to focus, even within the planning realm, of areas where they don't necessarily get um, the, the type of emphasis and the research that are needed. Uh, I want to thank the uh, Planning and Black Community Division Executive Board for helping to put uh, this together and with your feedback and preparation for this. Uh, I want to thank the City of Houston. In and of itself, I reached out to Mayor Turner. Uh, and uh, eventually the request got down to Rick. Uh, and so I just certainly appreciate the mayor's leadership there uh, and all of his staff, including um, Rick and his team there. Uh, and again, just want to say it's been a pleasure to kick off this webinar series on behalf of the division. Uh, look for more webinars, and we'll have some additional focus on some additional topics coming up uh, in 2019. Uh, and before I conclude, I certainly want to direct your attention. If you have any interest in joining Planning a Black Community Division, please visit uh, the website, 
www.planning.org. That's uh, APA's main website. And go to Divisions, and there you will see application to not only join Planning the Black Community Division, but a number of divisions within APA and a number of chapters. Um, if you are an APA member, membership is just uh, $20, $25. If you are not a member, you can still join the division for $40. Uh, and if you're a student, uh, membership is free up to five divisions. Um, and so I encourage you uh, to consider uh, either obtaining a membership with, within uh, Planning by Community Division or one of the divisions of APA uh, so that you can keep abreast of all the activities that, we're, that are going on here. Um, I think I covered everything. Again, thank you all for participating, uh, and uh, have a happy holiday season. And on behalf of the Planning Webcast Series, thanks to everyone for joining today. And look for more webcasts uh, in the upcoming months in 2019. And remember to file your CM credits by going to uh, planning.org. Thanks very much, everyone.